Hey, good morning. Welcome to Westbridge Church. My name is Jeremiah, and I'm a guest speaker this morning. I'm actually one of the pastors here at Westbridge, but uh, I've had several weeks off. Uh, we've been doing this series called Voices, and so uh, it's been uh, such a fun summer for us to hear from different speakers throughout the summer. I'm excited to be a part of the lineup uh, this weekend. And before we jump into the talk this morning, a couple of quick things. Uh, it's great to be back. Last weekend, my wife and I were off because my oldest daughter got married, which is crazy. Uh, so that's uh, absolutely nuts. They had a great time, a uh, honeymoon. They just got back last night. And then it took my 15-year-old daughter about 48 hours to renovate that bedroom after <laughs> it was like unbelievable transformation it was so fast it's like it could have been a show like extreme bedroom makeover like it was so fast uh, so that was pretty fun we did that this week and uh, and it's great to be back uh, I just want to let you know uh, we recognize uh, last weekend even while we were gone we had 11 new families show up and that's awesome. Uh, it's super fun to have lots of new faces, but we recognize it's getting full in here. And we've been saying this uh, at the same time, we're not going to go to three in the fall, in the summer just yet, because people are still uh, going on vacation and they're uh, going to the cabin, they're marrying off their kids, you know. So here's the deal. I uh, want, want you to be aware in the fall, we are going to three services. We're going to add a third service. We recognize it's starting to fill up. And uh, even as you know, all the people who are kind of gone during the summer come back in the fall, and then all the people who joined us in the summer, when we're all here together, we need many seats. And the reason that's so important to us is because we want you to be able to invite your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, your loved ones, your family members, and know that they're going to have a great experience, that there's going to be a seat for them. And so um, I just want to keep you aware, like it's not happening yet, but in about six, seven weeks from now, right after Labor Day, the Sunday after Labor Day, we will add a third service time and actually all of our service times will shift. And so this is what I want you to be aware of, 8 a.m., 9.30, and 11. 8 a.m., 9.30, 11. So we'll do three services. And uh, this also means that for us to make sure that all of those environments are fully staffed, fully ready to go, uh, we're going to be staffing all of our kids' areas through all three services. So if you would say this, hey, I'm still loving summer, but when fall hits, I would love to be able to help in the kids' area. Uh, that would be super helpful. And here's what that means. It doesn't mean I serve all three services every single weekend. It means I serve at one service out of the three twice a month. And if you would be willing to do that, that would help us as a church be able to staff all of those areas so that everybody who comes can check in their kids, can have a great experience, and be introduced to the love and grace of Jesus, and the people that you're inviting, that we would have a seat for them, that we would have room for their kids. And so if that's something that you'd say, I might be interested in that, just write, kids serve on the back of your connection card, drop it into the giving station, and we'll make sure and get in touch with you. And it doesn't mean you have to start next week. It means we would love to get you plugged in so that when we hit three services, we can hit the ground running. So that'd be huge. Uh, the other thing is just as we do that, um, I, I just want to remind us that as we continue to fill up this space, this auditorium, uh, if you do have small kids that you prefer to keep with you during the service, we've got some parent viewing rooms and uh, the lobby area. All of that is great for that because as more and more kids come into this area and kids start to act up a little bit, it, it can get a little bit distracting. And so just appreciate you utilizing those rooms uh, if you have small children that you prefer to keep with you. All right, today we are jumping into uh, one of the commands of Jesus that's probably one of the most misunderstood and mis misused uh, commands of Jesus in all the scriptures. It's where Jesus says, don't judge. Don't judge. If you have, uh, if you want one of your friends who uh, maybe doesn't go to church, maybe isn't a Jesus follower, but you want them to quote Jesus, just call something a sin and they will instantly quote this verse. Don't judge. The Bible says don't judge. You're not supposed to judge. Doesn't it say don't judge? And it's so misused. And the problem is that Jesus didn't say, don't judge, period, and just leave it at that. He said, don't judge. And then he gave the context for why we as humans tend to judge other people. And uh, what is it about us that does that in the wrong way? And actually, there is a way to make good judgments in your own life. And it's ironic how quick we are. It's just something in us as human beings. We all have this propensity to look at other people and to judge them based on exterior sort of markers. Right? It starts for us as early as middle school or high school. There's different groups of people that fall into different categories. You've got the jocks and the band geeks and the nerds, right? the, the average Joes. Uh, in the 60s, if somebody you know, drove a VW bus and they had a beard and a necklace with a peace sign around it, you would probably call them a what? A hippie. And you're just like, yeah, that obviously all those external markers point to that. 
How about in the 80s? You'd see somebody and they'd be wearing a, a suit and carrying a Wall Street journal and driving a Volvo. You'd probably call them a, a yuppie. A yuppie from the 80s. And even today, if you see someone wearing a, a deep V-neck with a scarf around their neck and skinny jeans and boots and they're listening to Mumford and Sons, you'd probably call them a, a hipster. That's right. Because groups just have these things that identify them, and it's tempting for us to judge people based on these external markers, these stereotypes. Uh, think about uh, bikers. Uh, what, what's a biker's favorite color? Black, right? Yeah. Uh, a biker's favorite fabric is leather. Uh, a biker's favorite type of art? Tattoos, right. And a biker's favorite beverage? Yeah, wine coolers. Wine coolers, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Little Bartles and James, yeah, yeah. What are the standards that you use to judge other people? What are these external sort of markers that we use to measure others? And in what ways do you judge the behavior of others? And what labels do you place on people? We've got generational labels, don't we? We've got uh, builders and boomers and, and busters and uh, Generation X and millennials and Gen, Gen Z. We've got all these labels and we can look and we can point our fingers at a specific age bracket, and we can go, well, that's why they are the way they are, because they were born between this year and this year. So this is how they think. We judge people driving on the road, don't we? Everyone who's faster than you is a maniac, and everyone who's slower than you is a moron. <laughs> but you drive the perfect speed, of course. Who do you judge? And the truth is, we all do this. There's, there's just this... There's something about human nature that causes us to judge other people. Is it possible you've already judged a number of people as you walked into church today? Is it possible that you, there are people in your life that you know that you judge more harshly than others based on your experiences with them? And the irony is we all fear and loathe the disapproval of others, and yet we take this somewhat secret thrill in the dark art of judging others. And we find uh, ways to label someone who doesn't think the same, doesn't behave the same way that we do. So it, we, we tend to create these artificial boundaries, and we tend to create us versus them. And it's in all of us. It's a brokenness that all of us have. There's this propensity in human nature to do this. And here's what I've discovered. The world conforms to whatever judgment I make. Like, 100% of my external judgments are always true, as long as I never have to get to know that person. Isn't that fascinating? My judgments are always true, as long as I never meet them in person. And what's interesting about this topic is that we live in the 21st century. We're enlightened. We're progressive, right? Live and let live, man. We see ourselves as great humanitarians. So what would it take for us to come face-to-face -face with the reality that sometimes... We judge others, and we make judgments about other people. And here's what's really amazing about this. Jesus, when he came to earth, he didn't just come to save us from our sins. That's part of it. But he also, when you think about it, he came to save us from our self-righteousness. Jesus came to save us from our self-righteousness. Because we have this tendency to think I'm right with God and somebody else isn't. In fact, Jesus actually reserved his harshest criticism for people who thought they had it all together. When you look at Jesus and the things that he talked about, I mean, he, he talked about uh, racial equity and he elevated the status of women in his society, but the thing that he called out the most more than anything else was people who thought they had it all together and in their self-righteousness, they looked down on other people. I mean, those were the people that Jesus constantly called out. And so we discover uh, in Luke, uh, Luke's uh, sort of uh, eyewitness account, is he's, he's talked to several eyewitnesses and he puts together this account of here's the life and teachings of Jesus. And he shares with us one specific incident. And here's what he says. He says, uh, then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. So there's this group of people, they're very confident that they, where they stood with God. They're like, okay, I, you know, I've behaved enough. I've done the right things. I've obeyed the law of Moses. And so I've been able to tip the scales at least 51% where me and God are good. And, and then there's this other group of people where, you know, I look at their life and I don't think that they've tipped the scales the same way that I have. And so I'm up here and they're down here. And I just want to make sure people know the difference. And so this is, this is who Jesus tells this story to. Luke says he told this story to these people. Here's the story. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself, 
and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not a sinner like everyone else. What a great prayer, huh? For I don't cheat, I don't sin, and I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance, and he dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. So you have this exact same scenario. The Pharisee's here, the tax collector's here. He won't even lift his eyes. Jesus says, instead, he beat his chest in sorrow. He, he knows, he knows he hasn't tipped the scales based on his own behavior. He's beating his chest in sorrow and says, oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. And here's how Jesus concludes the story. He says, I tell you this, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. Justified means in right standing. The one who left there in right standing with God was not the Pharisee. It was the tax collector. And you read the beginning of this, and it, it's, it feels like Jesus is telling some kind of weird, like, first century Jewish joke, right? He's like, all right, a Pharisee and a tax collector walk into the temple. And you're like, okay, where is this going? And Jesus' audience is probably assuming that they know the hero of the story. Well, it's going to be the Pharisee. He obeys the law of Moses. He does everything he's, you know, quote unquote, supposed to do. He's doing the right things. And nobody in Jesus' day liked tax collectors. There were no little kids who were like, I can't wait to grow up and be a tax collector. That's why Luke says they were despised. And to give you a little historical context, if you look at the career totem pole of uh, first century uh, Jewish people, it was tax collector, very, very bottom. They were traitors. They were despised. Just above that, dung collector. That was the next, like, like, you would rather be a dung collector than a tax collector. Can you imagine? Like, and that's a real career. Like, they rode a lot of livestock, so somebody had to clear the streets, you know? And, and so, can you imagine having, like, coming home and having that conversation with your wife if you're the dung collector? Like, you know, listen, Hiram, you've been bringing your work home a lot lately, and this just isn't working for me. But that is how low it was to be a tax collector. A Pharisee would never want to accidentally brush up against a tax collector even in the street, let alone pray next to one in the temple. And so who deserves to be able to pray next to a Pharisee, this holy man of God? Who deserves to be able to pray? Is it just only another Pharisee? What if that Pharisee is tipped to the scales 52% in God's favor? Now what happens? It's interesting, isn't it, when you dive into this a little bit, um, is there a certain type of person that you wouldn't want to sit next to in church? Let's bring this, like, to our context. Is there somebody you wouldn't be comfortable with sitting next to you? Think about that. A, a convicted felon? A prostitute? Somebody who, who has a, uh, an OnlyFans page? Somebody who is covered in tattoos and piercings or maybe somebody that has none of those things and is wearing pleated khakis and a polo. Maybe uh, an alcoholic. How about a Republican? How about a Democrat? How about a cat lover? How about uh, someone who's been divorced three times? How about a card-carrying member of the NRA? How about uh, a gay couple? How about someone who has HIV? How about someone who didn't raise their hands during the music? You're like, oh, the people who raise their hands, they really freak me out. What about someone who did raise their hands? Think about this. Spiritually bigoted people establish an attainable standard that they are able to live up to, and then they judge everyone who doesn't measure up to that standard. And you might think, yeah, religious people totally do that. All people do that. We all do that. That's human nature. There's a brokenness in us. Everyone does that. Faith or no faith, we like to establish a standard that fits us perfectly, and then we judge people who aren't like us. And there are norms and there are man-made rules that affect every organization and every country, every school, and certainly religious groups. And I'm not talking about just the basic uh, sort of uh, teachings of Jesus where Jesus says, this is the way that you ought to live. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about uh, standards that we make up where we're like, all right, well, I know God said this, but he really probably meant this, and so we're actually going to create this because, you know, God needs our help. We don't even want you to get close to that. And sometimes in religious organizations, people create these man-made rules they use to determine who's accepted and who's rejected, who's in, who's out, who's one of us, who's one of them. 
And many of you have experienced those religious boundary markers in your past. Many of you have been burned by churches in the past that, for whatever reason, created artificial standards and locked you out. And people get excluded from churches all the time because of their past, because of their relationship status, because of uh, the clothes they wear, the politics they vote for, the music they listen to, the way that they look, the beverages they drink, maybe even the way they pray. And for Jesus, this is so important, the biggest threat to his mission wasn't people who had blown it. The biggest threat was people who assumed they had it all together. That's who Jesus called out. And here's what you need to know. You are deeply, deeply loved by God. The person to your right is deeply loved by God. The person to your left is deeply loved by God. The person behind you is deeply loved by God. The person in front of you is deeply loved by God, especially if you're in the front row. (laughs) And here's the deal. I want you to know especially if you've never been here before, if you're new around here, if you're watching online, you need to know this, that no person should ever be denied access to the love of God based on ridiculous man-made external boundary markers. And no person in this church will ever be prevented from encountering God's grace because of prejudice. I want you to hear me say that. And yet it's in us. There's a brokenness in us. So why are we quick to do this? Why do we judge? Here's what it is. Judging others is how I manage my image. It's so much easier to manage my image if I can create some kind of external boundary. It makes it so much easier. Passing judgment is a mechanism that allows me to affirm myself in comparison to other people. And what's great is if I can somehow uh, make sure that my image is maintained, if I can somehow paint a picture of what I am, then I'm, I'm a little bit above somebody else. And what's even better, if we're honest, is, okay, somebody who the, the, the world or society kind of assumes is higher than me, and somehow I can lower them and get above them. That's even better, right? Because then I can really manage my image. I can elevate my own stature in my own head or in the eyes of others or maybe even in the eyes of God. And that's exactly what the Pharisee was doing. And so I want to take a look at some verses where Jesus specifically teaches on judging. And what does he say about it? So we're going to read them together. We find them in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus is doing this teaching on what it looks like to follow his way, to live life his way. And a part of this, he approaches this thing because this was a problem. It was a problem in the first century. It still continues to be a problem for us today. So here's what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 7, he says this. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I think it's really important for us to understand exactly what Jesus means by judging others. What does it mean to judge others? This verse is used incorrectly, misused, misinterpreted all the time, probably more than any other verse in the Bible. So what is Jesus really talking about when he says, don't judge? Well, let's look at some of the specific ways that you and I tend to judge other people. And maybe we don't even think about this in terms of judging others, but this is what we do when we do these things. Number one, we elevate ourselves by lowering others. I make myself feel better if I can lower somebody else. And what Jesus is saying about judgment is first, don't try to elevate yourself, either in your own mind or in a social setting by lowering other people. And there's a temptation for us that it's just, it's just, man, again, it's just human nature. It's the part of the brokenness of human nature to go, if I can just lower you a little bit, it makes me feel better about me. And we've all experienced this. That's why man-made norms and rules get established to begin with. It's why why we are tempted to create stereotypes and labels for people in middle school and in high school, and sometimes we just never outgrow that because we want to elevate ourselves to manage our image. Here's another way that we do that. We confuse behavior with identity. Here's how that works. When my kids were younger, we always, and we still want them to know this, but especially when they were young, we wanted to establish this with them. Sometimes, you know, one of my kids would lie to one of my other kids, and so the other kid would come and tell them, and they'd be like, they're a liar, Like, well, they're not a liar. No, they're a liar. It's like firm. Like, they are a liar. This is who they are. We should brand liar across their forehead. They're a liar. Like, okay, slow your roll there. Tell me the story, right? And it'd be like, oh, you know, somebody fibbed about something or they were trying to play a prank on them or whatever. And here's what we wanted them to understand early on because it's so important to understand this about human beings, that your behavior is different than your identity. Just because you do something that doesn't necessarily line up with the way of Jesus does not make you that. 
If you stole something, it doesn't make your identity a thief. If you lie, it doesn't make your identity a liar. It means you, you behaved in a way that it is not in line with who God created you to be. And so that's the tension. But when we automatically assume and, and when we put the two together and we go, well, this is what you've done, therefore this is who you are, we are putting ourselves in the position of God because only God determines identity. And when God looks at people, he does not determine their identity based on what they've done. Otherwise, my identity and your identity are big time in question. Instead, he looks at them and he goes, no, that's my son and that's my daughter. That's their identity. That's who I created them to be. Now, they may have behaved in a way that isn't consistent with their identity, but that doesn't change their identity. And when we make the assumption about someone based on something they've done, that this is now who they are, we, we have done a huge disservice to them and we've done a huge disservice to ourselves. Because that we have taken on the role of God. Only God gets to determine identity. And what he determines about people is that he loves them, that he cares about them. They are his son and his daughter. Here's another way that we judge other people. Number three, we evaluate the worth of one another. We evaluate the worth of one another. When you evaluate the worth of another person, you're assuming divine responsibility because only God gets to determine worth. Only God gets to determine value. And so Jesus wants to be really clear. Like, if you're going to judge other people, the way that you judge is going to be judged back to you. The measure that you use is going to be the measure used to judge you. Be really careful when you start to judge other people. And then he continues and he says this, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? It's fascinating, right? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? Now, you're not laughing as hard as Jesus' original audience probably would have laughed because uh, Jesus' audience would have thought this is hilarious. They'd be like, oh my gosh, that Jesus dude, did you, did you guys hear that? With the lumber and the sawdust? <laughs> so great. Jesus is being sarcastic. This is figurative language, right? This is hyperbole to make a point. And he's making a point through exaggeration and sarcasm, which I love because I have always believed that sarcasm is a spiritual gift. <laughs> and sometimes people come to Westbridge and are like, you guys are so, you know, irreverent and sarcastic. Did you know at one point in, in Jesus' same teaching, he says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Just look around. How many one-handed, one-eyed people do you see on your row? <laughs> Not that many. Yeah, because what is Jesus doing? He's, he's making a point. He's not being literal. Jesus is this amazing storyteller and communicator, and so he paints this picture. He says, look, don't assume God's responsibility by evaluating the worth of others. You don't get to do that. That's God's role. And also, don't identify them based on their action. You don't confuse their identity with their action. And, and don't try to elevate yourself by lowering others because somehow they don't meet your man-made rules and standards. And so he uses this incredible visual. In fact, just to illustrate it, does anybody have any lumber here this morning? Yeah. Oh, oh perfect. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you so much. It's amazing what people bring to church these days, you know? It's crazy. Yeah. So here's what Jesus says. This is the visual, right? He goes, why, why are you trying to deal with the speck in your brother's eye when you've got a plank in your own eye? This is the visual. He's like, you're, you're walking around like this, and you go up to your friend, and you're like, oh, hey, can we chat? <laughs> yeah, man, listen, you got a speck in your eye? <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I mean, we've all noticed it. And uh, like, I've been the one nominated to come and talk to you about it, because it's like, it's really awkward, man. Like, you really got to deal with that, and it's kind of hurting relationships, and you know, it's just, it's really hard to see you that way. And see, now we laugh because now we go, oh, yeah, that looks ridiculous, right? And Jesus is saying we can be blinded by our own inconsistencies, so blinded because all we want to do is focus on everyone else's shortcomings. In fact, if we're honest, speck hunting is a great smokescreen so that I don't have to deal with my own plank in my own eye. Going around looking for specks in other people's eyes is a great smokescreen for not having to deal with the plank in my own. That's why when we talk about the scriptures, we say it's so much better to use the scriptures as a mirror than as a magnifying glass. 
The question is, how does this apply to me? Not how can I make it apply to you? And so we, we live our lives with oftentimes double standards and we get frustrated when someone else falls short, but rarely do we stop and ask ourselves, what are the parts of my life that I need to align with the way of Jesus? See, the whole issue when it comes to judging people is control. We want to manage our image in the eyes of others. And so we work hard to try to make people what we think they should be. And at the same time, the irony is we can't even make ourselves the people that we want to be. And it's so much easier just to deal with somebody else's speck because then, you know, I don't have to admit there's actually a plank in my own life. Now, there are two things that Jesus is not saying about judging others. This is important distinction that we need to make. Number one, withholding judgment that's not the same as license to sin. You know what license to sin is? It's just going, okay, I can do whatever I want. I'm going to live however I want to. And Jesus is not saying this. Okay, I'm going to give you this umbrella verse so that no one can judge you. And if anyone ever tries to confront you on your behavior, then you can just say, hey, you're not supposed to judge. No judging. The Bible says not judge. It's like, do you remember as kids when you'd play tag and every group of friends had that one friend who had everything they touched was base? You remember that? Every group of friends had that one kid. And, he, and then you'd tag him, and he'd be like touching the railing. And he's like, nope, this is base. You can't tag me, it's base. And then he'd be somewhere else, and he'd like touch the shed. And he's like, now this is base. Nope, I'm safe. This is base. Base, nope, sorry, you can't tag me. This is base. You're like, come on, man. This is a loophole. This is not meant to be a loophole. It's not meant to be, I'm going to live my life however I want to. I can just do whatever I want to do, and then... Say that I'm following Jesus, but live however I want to because Jesus said you can't judge. That's not what Jesus is talking about. And sometimes in our culture, that's how we treat this verse. Jesus is very clear about what it means to follow him, to be a follower of Jesus. And uh, he's not giving you this verse to cling to as base anytime someone tries to confront you or speak truth into your life. That's important. Secondly, uh, withholding judgment from someone doesn't mean blind tolerance. It doesn't mean that uh, Jesus isn't saying just ignore every issue, ignore every problem, ignore every failure, don't rock the boat, don't ever confront anyone, never have a difficult conversation. There's nothing in the world that can't just be solved with a little kumbaya and a hug. Because I'm Jesus, and I'm just a peacemaker, man, just a little lammy slung over one shoulder. Peace to everyone. Sometimes we get this image that Jesus never caused friction, that he just like, you know, is floating around on quaaludes all day. And that wasn't Jesus. Tolerance is not the same as agreement. Love is not the same as agreement. And we've done a, a pretty poor job in our culture lately of putting love and agreement into the same camp. Can I tell you something? I don't have any friends, zero, that I agree with 100% of everything 100% of the time. But I have great friends. And we disagree and we still love each other. Because if our friendship is rooted in agreement in all things, then that is a fragile friendship. That is going to fall apart pretty quickly. In fact, love truly exists when there's disagreement, when there isn't agreement in all things. And I go, look, we don't exactly see eye to eye, but I still love you. This idea of tolerance doesn't mean you better agree with me or you're intolerant. This idea of tolerance means that, you know what, even though we don't see eye to eye, I, I don't treat you in unloving ways. I don't, I don't treat you with disrespect. I respectfully and lovingly might disagree with you, but I still love you as a person. I'm still committed to this relationship. It doesn't mean that I have to agree with everything. And I, I think we could probably all think of someone in our life who maybe makes some unwise decisions, maybe even makes some self-destructive or harmful decisions in their life. And Jesus is not saying, hey, don't judge means that you never confront someone, that you never have a difficult conversation with someone, that you never call them out as a friend about the, some of the decisions that they're making. In, in fact, following Jesus isn't about doing what is best for me. It's about leveraging what God has done in me for the benefit of others. And sometimes confronting someone that I love is actually a loving thing to do. And so when is that? When is it a loving thing to actually look at someone who I am in relationship with and say, hey, you're making some decisions here that I think are actually going to hurt you. See, Jesus actually gives some parameters for that. And making a judgment is actually loving. It can be loving if it falls into these parameters. Number one, if it begins with evaluating my own heart. If I start and I look at the plank first, 
Listen to what Jesus says next. He doesn't just say, hey, you know, don't forget, you've got a plank too, so deal with that. He doesn't just leave it there. He continues. Here's what he says in the next verse. He says, you hypocrite. Why does he say hypocrite? Because if, if you're going speck digging and you've got a plank sticking out of your eye, you're a hypocrite. So he says what? First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. He says, hey, look, I'm not saying you shouldn't help your brother with the speck in his eye, but before you do that, you better deal with this first. This is really important. Deal with this first. See, our response to either sin or unwise decisions or destructive lifestyle that we see in other people is to first look within my heart and say, God, what do you want to do with me? And if we do this, we would be better off and our friend would be better off. And Jesus says, if you're too insecure, if you're too self-righteous, if you're filled with too much pride that you can't honestly self-evaluate the areas in your own life where you fall short, you have no business talking to somebody else. In fact, do you know why our culture has oftentimes written off the church as being hypocritical? It's not because people in our culture are unaware of the speck in their own eye. It's just that they are so, it's just been so obvious. They've seen an unwillingness on the part of the church to deal with the plank in our own. They see the church as standing here with a plank and a bullhorn yelling at them about their speck. And if we're honest about our own level of brokenness, about our own need for forgiveness, about our own need for God's help, then we might actually be in a position to help someone else. And honestly, that's what the church is. It's a group of broken people. None of us are Jesus Jr. None of us have graduated. All of us are doing our best every day when we wake up to put one foot in front of the other and to go, today I'm doing my best to follow the way of Jesus, to love like Jesus loves, to live like Jesus lives, to follow his way of living. And then there's days where I fall short and I make poor decisions, unwise decisions, unloving decisions, selfish decisions, wrong decisions, things... Things that I know are wrong while I'm doing it, and I still do it anyways because in the moment I was emotionally attached to something down that path, and I decided to do it anyways. And what is that? That's what it means to live in community, that we would help one another when we fall, that that we would pick one another up, recognizing, okay, I need God's help, and you need God's help, but first, I'm going to deal with my own self-evaluation. I'm going to ask for help from other people as I deal with this, and then I'm in a position to then help others when they fall. But first, I deal with this before I go looking to help other people. First, I I point inward and go, God, what are you doing in me? And secondly, making a judgment can be loving if it's motivated by a desire for restoration. If it's motivated by by a desire to just be right because you know you're right and it's fun to be right, it's a very bad motivation. It, it, it is how you communicate that makes a difference. And, and are you approaching this person with grace or is this just a vehicle of judgment for you? There's a big difference between a meat cleaver and a scalpel, but both will get the job done. I don't know any guy who's going to get a vasectomy with a meat cleaver <laughs> over a scalpel. See, the scalpel does as little damage as possible to bring healing. And Jesus clarifies what this means. In the next verse, he gives a lot of clarity around this. He says this, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. So there you go. I mean, duh, right? (laughs) Clears it right up. And then he continues and he says, if you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So I think we all got that, right? All right, let's close in prayer. Like, did I miss a verse? What happened here? (laughs) Jesus is like, all right, guys, don't judge. The measure that you judge. Also, like, don't dig in the specks because you got a plank. And also, like, I know you're really tempted to throw all your jewelry to farm animals, but, like, don't do that. And you're like, what happened? Well, what if there's actually a flow? Like, what if the, the, the pearls to the swine actually relates to the lumber, which relates to the judging? And that's exactly what's happening here. This is a a question of discernment. It's a question of approach. And Jesus is saying this. Okay, don't don't take on God's role by determining someone's worth and elevating yourself over them. You're not in a position to do that. And by the way, don't go try to dig out everyone else's problems when you've got problems of your own. 
Do some self-evaluation first, and then you might be able to actually help someone as we help each other move forward to become who God's created us to be. And then don't give sacred things to people who won't appreciate it. What is a pig going to do with a pearl? It's just going to trample it. They don't appreciate it. There's no value in that to them. So Jesus is saying to use discernment in who and in how we choose to confront if it's needed, how we have those conversations. And just because you think you're right doesn't mean that someone will hear it and respond the way that you want them to. And if you feel that you need to make a judgment and confront someone, then your motivation, your end game, if you feel like, man, I, I need to have a difficult conversation with someone because I love them and care about them, your end game must be restoration. It must be for their benefit, not because you think you're right and you enjoy being right. And when you think about it, it's exactly what Jesus did for you and me. See, when Jesus came into our world, one of his closest friends and followers, a guy named John, writes out his eyewitness account. And when he does, this is the way that he described Jesus coming into our world. He said this about him. He said, so the word became human. The word is a reference to Jesus, this idea that Jesus was this thought or this word, and he comes into human form. So, so John writes, the word became human, and he made his home among us. He was full of grace and truth. He was full of grace and truth. See, this is what Jesus did for us. He brought grace and truth. But what Jesus did is he leaned so hard into grace first. He leaned so hard into grace to let us know how much he loves us. And then in his love, he leads us to truth to help us become all he's created us to be. You see this with Jesus over and over and over and over and over again. People are brought to him, they're like, this person sinned, did Jesus make a judgment? And he's like, I don't condemn you. But also stop doing that because that's hurting you. And I'm so for you that you should stop doing that. But even if you can't and even if you never do, I don't condemn you. There's this idea in church world that we've got to stand up for truth. We've got to deliver truth, deliver truth, deliver truth. And here's what happens unintentionally. The church has truth leading the train. It's the engine at the front of the train, and it's this truth train. Here's where we stand. Here's where we stand. Here's where we stand. And then there's this little grace caboose at the back of the train that goes, but I love you. <laughs> and people go, yeah, I feel the love. I mean, I just got clobbered with the truth train, but man, a little, little love caboose at the end. It feels a little pretty good for a second. And then we wonder... Why isn't the church attractive to our culture? Because that isn't the way Jesus operated, and he could have. In fact, if anybody could have operated truth first and grace at the end, it would have been Jesus. He could have come into the world and gone, uh, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. I saw what you did last summer. And he didn't do that. When people were brought to Jesus, he just goes, I don't condemn you, I don't condemn you, I don't condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Go and stop doing that. I don't condemn you. But that sin is hurting you, so because I love you, stop doing that. But it was always grace, grace, grace. So here's what we want to do as a church. We want to let grace and love be the engine that drives the train. It's just grace, 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 grace. We love you. We're for you. We want you here. God loves you. You're his child. You're his son. You're his daughter. Hey, question, what do you think of this? Yeah, you yeah, should probably stop doing that. It's the it's truth caboose at the end of a grace train. But here's, the, here's what happens. When we spend time leading with grace, leading with love, now I, I have a position because I've, I've done the work of the stuff in my own life that now my, my truth can be accepted because now I actually have a position to speak from out of relationship and love and grace. And when we reverse that, we really mess up the message of Jesus. This is what Jesus did for us. He led with grace, which means this. You don't have to change anything to come to Jesus. Like, that's the good news of the message of the scriptures. The, the story of the scriptures, cover to cover, is that God is building a family and he wants you in it. And there's nothing you have to do to earn your way into God's family. That God loves you as is. He accepts you as is, period. Period. But then God loves you too much just to leave you as is. That's where truth comes in. He'll never change the acceptance part. 
You're already in the family. That's your identity. But then because he loves you, he goes, hey, by the way, here's how I want you to live. Because I love you and I'm for you, and if you live this way, it's just your life will flourish. But even if you don't, and even when you fall short, and even when you can't, you're my son, you're my daughter. I love you. In fact, we messed this up as human beings. Every, we were created for this, to exist in loving community with God and with others. And every one of us, from the first human beings to every one of us today, at some point, we screwed this up. That's why God, at the right time in human history, sent Jesus into the world to show us how much we mean to him, to show us what our identity is. To, in the ultimate expression of love, God allowed himself, Jesus allowed himself to be put to death. His body was laid in a tomb. And according to multiple eyewitness accounts, he rose from the dead. And that means death is not the end. There's more to this life than this life. And you and I have been invited to be a part of God's family. And so I want to encourage you, whether you're watching online, you're here in the room, if you've never said yes to that invitation, God accepts you as is. And then from there, he will continue to lead with truth. Grace says, you're, come as you are, but in truth, he'll say, but now let me help you continue to grow to be all I've created you to be. If you've never said yes to that invitation, you can do that. Online, here in the room, just agree with this simple prayer in your own heart as we close. God, please forgive my sins. Forgive me for those times where I've walked away from you, and I thank you that you've never walked away from me. And I pray, just adopt me into your family. Make me your son. Make me your daughter. I want to say yes to that identity. And I want to do my best to live that out. Not, not as a way to somehow earn a place in your family, but to recognize I'm already a part of your family. And so now help me to live out that identity as best as I know how. Help me to trust you. Help me to follow you. And God, I pray for every one of us who are doing our best to follow the way of Jesus before we go spectating in other people's eyes. Help us to deal with the plank in our own. And may we be a group of people who recognize, even in our own brokenness, that we accept each other as is, and then we help each other. We link arms in our brokenness, and we, we help each other move forward to become all you've created us to be. May we lead with grace, even as we bring people to truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, as we close today, we're going to give you guys an opportunity to take a portion of what God has entrusted with you financially to give back as a way of an act of obedience to him. Um, but as we prepare to do that, um, if you guys want to pull out your connection cards, and we've actually got a couple things coming up that I want to make you guys aware of. The first is, uh, like we said in the video, like I said in my uh, opening transition, we have First Step next weekend, and if you've never done that, uh, you can either go and sign up on our events page, uh, or you can just write First Step on your connection card, and we'll reach out to you. Uh, we also have baptisms on the 21st of August, and that's going to be at BB Lake after church. So if you've never been baptized before, it's cool. You get to get, be baptized in a lake, uh, and we already have five people signed up for that. We love watching people who've been transformed by Jesus uh, take that next step into baptism to make a declaration of their faith. Uh, and so we encourage you guys to sign up for that. And then also tomorrow morning, we... I, along with, uh, I think, 57 other middle school and high schoolers will be going off to camp. Um, and so if you have a student that is coming with us, we're going to be here. It's super early at 7 a.m., um, and then we're leaving here at 7.30. Uh, so pray for us. Pray for me that I uh, that I'm, keep my sanity. I appreciate that. Um, and also, if you guys are like, hey, you, you just told us a lot. I'm not really sure. The events page, all that stuff. Just write whatever you're interested in on your connection card, and we'll make sure to get in touch with you, um, whether it be kids kids serving or whatever we've got going on here. So uh, we want to make sure, hello, uh, you get plugged in where you need to be. So yeah, that's all we got for you guys this week. The giving slides will be up here. Um, you can give your giving envelopes in the back and we will see you guys next weekend.